Okay, let's get started. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, taking the time out to uh, to come down, um, you know, and listen to us talk uh, today. Uh, thanks again, uh, you know, to the uh, the folks hosting this, uh, you know, seminar and uh, conference. Like, I think it took a lot of effort to like pivot from you know a live conference to a virtual one. So thanks to all the folks uh, on the organizing side for putting this up at such short notice. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a bit about uh, feature flow. Uh, which is a service that we built at Critio for uh, speeding our feature data generation. Uh, so a bit about me, um, I'm a staff lead um, at Critio AI Labs. Uh, the team that I lead basically is responsible for building this service uh, feature flow that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, a lot of the work, uh, you know, that I'm going to be, a lot of the, the um, you know, really interesting pieces that I'm going to be talking about today have actually been built uh, by folks in my team. Uh, you know, I have some uh, really awesome engineers that I work with, um, and I've got a couple of their pictures down uh, on the screen, Spurti and Benoit. Uh, so big, uh, big shout out to them uh, for doing all the work that I'm going to be talking about. Um, aside from, uh, you know, what I do on my day to day job, I'm really fond of uh, travel and nature photography. So that's something that I'm uh, really fond of. Anyway, let's get started. Uh, so here's what I have um, in mind for today. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of an overview about Critio and why we decided to build uh, the service feature flow. Um, and then try to give you all a sense for, you know, what is the broad uh, sort of architecture that we ended up uh, going with. And then we try to dive into, you know, the individual pieces of this architecture, basically like different parts, um, you know, different angles, and try to really dive into, you know, some of the considerations that we had to deal with, uh, some of the constraints we had, and also some of the learnings that, uh, you know, we took away, you know, some of the contributions we made uh, to the Flink project as part of this. Um, and then we'll wrap up, you know, with uh, with an eye towards like what we're trying to work on, you know, in the future and uh, so on. Um, so a bit about Critio. Um, so we're a company that has been around for for a while. For you know, those of you who don't know, uh, we are headquartered in Paris. Um, and like you can see, uh, you know, in the picture uh, below, um, you know, we do get, uh, you know, have a really nice view of the uh, Paris skyline. Uh, you know, on a good day, uh, you know, on the rooftop and stuff. Um, but we are a global company. We are spread across a lot of offices worldwide. Um, so I, for example, work out of the Ann Arbor office um, and a lot of our colleagues work from like different offices around the world. Um, so what does Critio do? Um, at the heart of it, uh, we are an online advertising company. Um, so what that means is that we try to connect users uh, to the most relevant product to them at the right time. Um, so we're basically trying to merge users to something that they want at the relevant time for them. Uh, what it means in terms of reach is that we actually end up reaching um, over a billion users. Um, so we do have a pretty large reach worldwide. Um, and we end up serving, you know, a few billion ads, uh, you know, roughly a day. Um, so there's, there's, there's a fair bit of like users and traffic that we end up dealing with. So that brings us to why we actually went uh, went about building this service uh, feature flow. Um, and one of the problems that um, you know a lot of users at Critio of machine learning or people who are trying to build machine learning data sets, machine learning pipelines had was that it was really hard to experiment and add new short term features. Uh, so when I see short term features, I mean things like, you know, you're trying to compute the counts um, you know, of clicks or counts of displays, you know, various types of aggregations over a short periods of time. Uh, you know, this period of time might be, you know, in the range of a few minutes up to, you know, hours or maybe even a day or two. Uh, this was really a problem for a lot of folks um, at Critio. And the reason for this were um, largely a couple of aspects. Um, so firstly, as part of ad adding these new experimental features, what you had to do was you had to end up um, appending and changing, you know, live production systems um, and services. Um, as you can imagine, when you're ex experimenting with machine learning features, you don't really know what the payoff is going to be at that time. Um, so here you are, you know, as part of experimenting with features, you're going out and changing a live production system that is actually bringing in revenue and bringing in money by adding these experimental features, which might not really have a payoff, right? So that there's a bit of a risk there. Um, the other aspect of this is uh, these production services that uh, we had in place, which basically take the actual user traffic, which is where folks were adding these features. These production services at Critio are written in C-sharp. Um, 
Now, if you need to take the same logic to compute your features, say you've got uh, you know, a complex feature where you're computing some aggregations, and you want to use the same logic in say your batch jobs or in your offline jobs, either you want to backfill your training data, or if you want to you know, reuse the same logic for long-term features, say you want to compute the same, same type of a feature over a time period of seven days or 30 days, you essentially need to re-implement this across multiple um, runtimes. You need to implement this across uh, the .NET and the G, uh, C Sharp side as well as over JVM. So you need to basically do the work twice, right? So that uh, both of these things end up like resulting in a fair bit of friction for users, and that slows down the entire you know machine learning uh, sort of life cycle and uh, workflow. So one of the suggestion, uh, one of the ideas that suggested itself was to basically try to take some of this out, uh, sort of this business logic out of these um, sort of top level applications um, and start computing these features externally, you know, in a streaming application. So basically in a streaming architecture that that was what we sort of decided to think about. But one of the other problems that we had, and I think a lot of other companies have touched upon this in, you know, this fling forward as well as prior ones is, that when you're trying to build uh, you know, new streaming jobs, um, there tends to be a high degree of accidental complexity. Um, and this differs from company to company. Um, so at Critio, for example, um, you know, if you were to write a streaming job to compute your machine learning features, you would have to end up spending a lot of time writing a lot of boilerplate code uh, to you know, read and work with streams, to configure them, to parse them, to make sure you're handling watermarks correctly. You need to make sure you set a monitoring and alerting. Uh, you need to have the right set of deployment tooling in place so that you're deploying your jobs in the right way. You're making sure you're taking save points before you upgrade and things like that. You need to handle your runtime infrastructure, make sure your uh, you know, Flink cluster or whatever cluster you're running has the right tuning knobs and stuff in place. But from a user perspective, you really just care about implementing the business logic of your job. You don't care about all this other stuff that you're forced to do. And this level of friction varies uh, from place to place. And at Critio, there, there is a reasonable amount of it, which is why uh, you know, uh, the idea of actually building a self-service um, you know, sort of suggested itself. So basically a hosted service where people could you know, push in their uh, sort of business logic jobs and have them compute things the right way. So along with this uh, you know, set of accidental or incidental complexity, there was a fair bit of inherent uh, sort of challenges and idiosyncrasies that we had to deal with in our set setup. Uh, so one is that most of our event streams range in the 50,000 to 100,000 uh, you know, events um, a, a second, uh, which roughly works out to a few billion messages a day. So it's not a huge amount of traffic, but there's a fair bit. Um, in terms of like the user jobs, the cardinalities can vary a fair bit. Uh, you can have cardinalities, you know, in the tens of thousands, say if you're trying to do uh, computing counts by say campaign or, you know, some of those uh, types of um, scopes. I mean, it can range all the way up to, you know, a few hundred million if you're trying to compute these features by a user in a particular region, right? Um, another aspect um, that ends up being uh, sort of relevant for us at Critio is that a lot of our services and infrastructure tend to run on-premise DCs. Uh, we tend to use a lot of our uh, sort of services in-house as much as we can, uh, basically using uh, open source projects as well. Uh, but we do end up using cloud providers when there's a gap in any of our internal services and stuff. And this is something that we'll uh, sort of get into a little bit more when we talk about the runtime infrastructure. Um, along with this, there were a few things that we had to support from the, the get-go. Uh, we need to support multiple sync backends like Cassandra, um, Couchbase, Kafka. Um, we also wanted to support uh, you know, multiple ways in which users can iterate on their jobs. Uh, so one uh, idea was to have like an easy way for you to experiment with the logic of your jobs by you know, providing CLI support. The other one was to provide things like you know, having an easy way for you to test the logic of your jobs and stuff. So that's what we set out to do. Uh, so we started off with the use case of just short-term feature generation, uh, but then we extended this uh, service, um, which we basically call Feature Flow, to also work with uh, you know real-time analytics work uh, use cases and workloads as well. And it essentially provides a lot of the stuff that I've touched upon already. It gives you a Flink runtime, um, it makes sure that the monitoring and alerting is set up for you. It makes sure that you have support of like various syncs that you can use in your jobs, um, as well as things like end-to-end -end tests and so on. So let's take a look at the broad architecture. Um, so from a user perspective, um, you're gonna provide uh, you know, a set of config files which define your job. 
These config files are picked up by a service that we call the scheduler. And this scheduler is going to be responsible for creating your Flink uh, job graph. And it's going to assign it to the relevant cluster. Um, and that job is going to basically consume the appropriate Kafka streams, you know, compute your features or whatever logic you've set out to complete and write that out to, you know, the relevant syncs that uh, you have configured. So now what we'll try to do is try to focus on these individual components a little bit more in detail and try to work through, you know, some of the considerations and, uh, you know, challenges we try to tackle as part of them. So the first thing from a user perspective is the user interface. Uh, so this for us is com consists of two parts. Uh, so one of them is a DSL where you can define various aspects of your job, like the metadata piece where you can say, okay, you know, which, which team owns the job, there's a link to the documentation. Uh, the other aspect is which runtimes do you want the scheduler to target? Uh, you know, which platforms do you want this job to run on so that the scheduler can make sure that it only handles those, which cluster do you want to target within that? Um, environment, uh, you can specify which um, output syncs you want. You can have one or more of them, um, as well as the parallelism of your job. You know, you can specify how, how what, what's the degree of parallelism you, you need. The next aspect is the actual user interface in uh, in terms of like how you actually want to compute your counters, right? Um, so the way we end up having our users do this is you provide a Flink uh, SQL query. Uh, so this is basically a standard Flink SQL query. There's no um, sort of major changes to that. You can, you know, build your query based on like the standard Flink documentation, you know, the standard set of Flink functions and stuff are available. Uh, but a lot of the times what ends up happening is that uh, you might need to use some logic, which is not really part of like the existing Flink, uh, you know, functions and stuff which are available. Uh, so we do support, uh, you know, the notion of you adding user-defined functions and user-defined aggregation functions. So basically, uh, you, you know, our users just have to uh, derive from the relevant Flink interfaces, uh, you know, add the appropriate annotations, and we end up picking that up uh, for them. Aside from this, we've also provided uh, a way for users to experiment with these queries really easily using uh, basically an extension to the Flink CLI which pulls in uh, you know, all of our Kafka sources and stuff. Uh, so it basically hooks up the, the relevant Kafka sources that we have at Credio, um, and you can launch the CLI and just test out your queries really easily before you know, trying to run them on you know, any environment. So the second aspect that we had to kind of deal with from uh, sort of the user interface perspective was having support for some sort of an end-to-end -end test framework. Uh, so the idea behind this was to basically allow users another way to, to validate their SQL queries. A lot of the queries might be really simple, like the one you saw on the previous slide where you're just computing 10 minute counts. But in some cases, your queries might be a little bit more complicated where you're joining multiple time aggregations and stuff. So it helps to have a way to validate them you know, in some way. So the idea is really simple. Uh, you can basically, um, you know, provide, uh, you know, mock events um, for your input streams in a JSON file. And you can pick arbitrary pieces of time where you actually want to validate what the values of your output counters are going to be. Uh, so when you have your query, you can just say, okay, I want to validate, you know, what the values would be at say 14 o'clock. This is what I expect the counters to be. Say at 16 o'clock, this is what I expect the counters to be. So you provide these two sets of JSON files. One is the set of input uh, events, uh, mocked input events, and the other one is what you expect your results to be. And we basically run the validation for you every time there's a build. So now that you have these uh, config files and SQL files and UD user-defined functions, uh, you basically want to have them scheduled on a cluster, right? Um, so that's really the job of our scheduler. Um, and this is really responsible for taking your SQL file, uh, you know, taking other aspects like which things you're uh, interested in and basically stitching together a Flink job graph for you. And depending on which uh, runtime environments you want to schedule uh, this on, which clusters you want to target, it's going to basically check on that relevant cluster and see, okay, is, the, is your job already running there? If it's not running, it's going to launch it. If it's already running, it's going to check the the job graph of the job that is running on the cluster and compare that against the job graph of the job that you want to deploy now. And if they differ, it's going to upgrade the job uh, after taking a save point and stuff in, in a safe manner. So now a little bit about our uh, runtime infrastructure. 
Um, so I think we're one of the few, uh, you know, folks to run Flink on Mesos in production. Um, I think we might be one of sort of maybe an endangered uh, breed, I guess. Um, and we had to do a little bit of work to, to get this to work. Um, I think, um, so one of the things that we had to do is that uh, Mesos clusters are spread uh, worldwide. Um, and one of the constraints that we had is we didn't have a blob store uh, available, uh, you know, in these locations. Um, so one of the things that we ended up doing is adding support uh, to basically store Flink's checkpoint and save point data and Azure's blob store. This was one of the contributions that we made. Um, along with this, um, we also had to add some changes to uh, basically Flink's Meso scheduling code uh, to basically get it to you know work with um, with Azure. Um, so one of the aspects was adding support for disk space uh, resources. Um, and the other one was around basically how we could schedule jobs, um, you know, larger jobs on uh, on Mesos. Uh, we ended up seeing a lot of problems when we tried to schedule larger jobs. We were getting a lot of offers from Mesos, um, which were basically getting rejected by Flink um, over a very long period of time. So our jobs were basically taking a couple of hours to get scheduled. So we ended up making a couple of um, sort of contributions to Flink to expose a couple of knobs in the Fenzo scheduler that Flink uses to schedule jobs at Mesos so that we could tune, you know, how quickly we uh, reject offers that we don't, uh, you know, don't want to use. How long that, uh, sh how long should Mesos wait before it resends some of these offers back to us and stuff? And after that, we were able to get our uh, scheduling time down to, you know, a couple of minutes rather than a few hours. But one of the fun things about, uh, you know, building software and building software that runs in production is you end up running into interesting issues along the way. So we ran into this issue, um, you know, a little bit after we made some of these Mesos scheduling changes where we basically saw that our jobs were getting restarted a lot, you know, occasionally every few weeks or so, it would just run for a few minutes, get restarted, which you can kind of see on the right-hand side of this job, uh, of this graph. So what ended up happening in this case was that uh, basically our Mesos deployment team uh, was rolling out a new version of Mesos, which ended up resulting in, you know, our jobs basically, inevitably one of our task managers would be on a particular Mesos host that was getting restarted due to a deployment upgrade. Um, so we would basically constantly see the Flink jobs getting restarted because one of the task managers or the other was getting upgraded. Um, so the fix we put in for, for this was a basically uh, ended up being a short term thing uh, that we have in place right now was essentially to try and pack our task managers on fewer Mesos hosts. For now, we've basically been able to get around this problem, but it's one of those things that we might actually have to keep an eye on as our jobs get much larger. Another fun issue that we ran into, I guess this is one of those war stories that is pretty common, um, is you know our checkpoint times went up substantially, uh, which you can kind of see from this graph. You can see that the uh, you know the list latencies uh, basically went up from uh, from you know a couple of hundred milliseconds to you know a few seconds, um, and this ended up essentially resulting in our um, you know our checkpoints, uh, you know, from Flink taking, you know, 30 odd seconds as compared to two or three seconds that they used to take normally. Um, and we spent a fair bit of time digging into this and trying to go back and forth with the Azure folks. And it turns out that it was really about uh, a functionality that they have in place called lifecycle management that we were using, which was messing up, uh, you know, the way, uh, you know, the Azure HDFS libraries were working. And it was ending up making a lot of really expensive list calls. So one of the things that we ended up doing was trying to do the lifecycle management manually in the schedule ourselves. So the other thing, to touch upon is basically some of the sources and syncs that we uh, support. Uh, so in terms of sources, we only support Kafka. We had a couple of uh, nice improvements in terms of performance, which I'd like to call out. So one was to actually use the row serializer exclusively, which resulted in a five to eight uh, times performance improvement in terms of like records, right? So that's like a nice improvement. And the other one was to actually enforce using projection pushdown, which ended up resulting in a 2.5x performance improvement. And in terms of syncs, we support HDFS, uh, Kafka, and Couchbase. Um, in terms of operations, we provide, you know, like basically like a nice uh, sort of self-service dashboard and stuff. Uh, you know, we have two of these dashboards uh, that you can kind of see, which we provide for users. And since we're running close to out of time, I'll go to the last bit. Uh, so in terms of some of the future work, we're trying to explore how do we use some engines like Flink Batch or Flink Hive to actually compute some of these same jobs in an offline fashion. Uh, we are using the streaming file sync, so we want to explore trying to minimize the number of small files that they create. 
Um, and the other two topics are around bootstrapping state, uh, which is again a topic that a lot of people have brought up. So we want to have, have a way to basically speed up the bootstrapping of our state. Um, and lastly, basically handling state evolution when you know your SQL queries change drastically, your your state uh, you know is not really compatible with the old version of the state. So that's something that we want to address as well. I think we are out of time. I don't know if we have time for questions. 